I did want to start with this story because you'll be off um, covering the USMNT. Hashtag. Um, is it next week, week after? Um, and this Greg Bearhalter story, I just think it's fascinating. And I have mm. a void in my life for drama since we lost um, the Rebecca Vardy, Colleen Rooney, uh, Wagatha Christie story. So yeah. I like this. Now, I will just caveat this by saying I think it's really funny, this whole thing, but I'm not diminishing domestic violence at all. Hmm. Um, and if you are suffering from domestic violence, make sure you reach out to somebody. The only way it's going to get better is by doing that. So I'll caveat all that by saying I don't think that particular aspect is funny. The rest of it is really funny. Um, so Greg Bearhalter currently isn't hashtag USMNT manager because of this whole incredible story where Danielle and Claudio Reyna got in touch with the high command at US Soccer to relay a story from 1992, which has now been investigated. And Greg Bearhalter is, for, for the want of a, of a better phrase, uh, cleared to reapply for the job he lost on December 31st. It's more complicated than that, but that's broadly what's happening. Um, but this investigation has thrown out some incredible, incredible things. Um, one interview in the investigation described Claudio Reyna's outreach over Gio Reyna's treatment at the World Cup as inappropriate, bullying and mean-spirited. Essentially, what is written in this report is that Claudia Reyna and Danielle Reyna were the ultimate overbearing parents at a six-a-side tournament on a Sunday, were not happy their boy wasn't being picked, were not happy with the manager, who's like an old friend of Claudia Reyna as well. Um, and there was a one part of this as well. In an email in 2018, Claudio complained about a female referee in a match Geo played in saying, quote, and in all honesty, can we get real and have male refs for a game like this? It's embarrassing, guys. What are we trying to prove? A game like this deserves better attention. Um, and there's more of the behavior of the Rayner family in terms of Geo in Qatar as well, which, I mean, they do not come out well from this report at all. Um, cursing and acting horribly come up a lot. Um, and actually, there's a line in this which reminded me of Wagon of the Christie. Here we go. Quote, there were 150 people in the friends and family program at this year's World Cup. All were having a great time, except for five people who were absolutely miserable. The five were cursing and acting horribly. It was the Rainers. Mm. Um, talk to me, Danny. What's going on here? What's the fallout from this report, Ben? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fallout. Listen, this was a nuclear bomb with regards to U.S. soccer. And... This is a difficult one to talk about because there's so many variables at play. Um, I, I've I've made it very clear during my kind of first experiences with the national team, being around Claudio Reyna, being around Greg Berhalter, um, as players, they they always treated me very well. I, I enjoyed my time around them as players. Once they retired, um, got to know them differently. I, I I'm not I wouldn't call I wouldn't say I'm friends with either of them, but. I'm friendly with both of them. Um, and to watch them have the success they've had post playing career from, you know, Claudio going into uh, overseeing NYCFC, the launch there, overseeing the launch of, of Austin FC, to watching Greg become the manager that he was at Columbus and then for the US men's national team. Uh, let me pull it back. In a time in which we should be we should be moving forward with such great momentum over what I think was a very strong showing at the World Cup for this group of players. We find ourselves in a really difficult time as U.S. soccer fans because, number one, we don't have a head coach. Number two, we don't have a general manager. And number three, we no longer have a sporting director as Brian McBride has stepped down from his general manager role and Ernie Stewart has left U.S. soccer to take over PSV Eindhoven. Um, it feels like... We're kind of in that phase after we missed out on the World Cup where Dave Sarikin did an admirable job of filling in after Bruce Arena stepped down and everyone was calling for U.S. soccer to be burnt to the ground, that everything was trending in the right direction. And from the end of the World Cup to now, which is effectively three months, it felt like it feels like a nuclear bomb's gone off. Um, the. If, if you would have told me at the start of the World Cup that Gio Reyna was only going to play something around like 54 minutes for the entirety of the World Cup, I would have told you something has gone horribly wrong or there must have been some type of major injury that he was dealing with that was unknown to any of us because the trajectory 
of this young man's career is nothing short of extraordinary. And he does have the capability of being an elite international player. Mm. And, and you can see glimpses of what he's capable of doing at Borussia Dortmund, whether it's in the Bundesliga or in the Champions League. So whatever transpired within that camp and the relationship between Gio and Greg Berhalter from manager to player uh, became very, very compliment, uh, complicated. And this is something that we talk about with camps, with national teams, with going into World Cups. It's, how do you, it's not always about the best players. It's about the best group of players that you can get through a camp together and all be heading in the right direction. So you've got all of these these different variables, right? Then you get to the relationship between Greg Berhalter and Claudio Reyna. You get to the relationship between Rosalind and Danielle. Um, you've got two guys that have grown up playing playing soccer together, playing football together, similar pathways, albeit different, that spent some time in the U.S. college system and immediately moved overseas and traversed different countries at various levels of success um, and, and, and were real big... Claudio, a staple of U.S. soccer. Greg, a very, very solid center back uh, in U.S. soccer as players. The relationship of the wives playing college soccer together. All of these things tell us the history of these two families and how close they were. So to see it unravel uh, with such distaste and to see it unravel publicly, I mean, there, there, there's no right words for something like this. Mm. There, there really, there's no right way to describe this. It's, it, it can be disgust, it can be outrage, it can be empathy, empathy, and it can be disappointment. And all of those things individually can stand true. And all of those collectively, I think, maybe do the best job of, of, of us trying to verbalize what we're seeing from the outside looking in. I can tell you from outside U.S. soccer, everybody looks at this and like clown show like what yeah. what are you guys doing how, mm. how is this how is this so dramatic it being something that's behind the scenes now coming out publicly and the parental control and where's the policies and how do you and so you know when 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 i look at kind of the management of this situation for ernie stewart and and brian mcbride the complexities of trying to manage prior relationships and friendships and playing careers. And remember, all four of these guys, Ernie Stewart, Brian McBride, Claudio Reyna, Greg Berhalter, played at World Cups together. Yeah. The, the, these guys these guys went to battle on the international stage together. So there's a complexity in managing the situations. But when you throw children into the mix, we all know how complicated that gets. We all know. We've watched this. We've watched helicopter parents. We've watched hands-on parents. We've watched hands-off parents. And and And... How, however, parents decide to manage the 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 children's career or pathway or whatever that looks like, that's up to them. Mm. You know, th there's there's consequences with decisions and choices that come out to play. So as I try to, I don't know, unravel what this 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 crazy web has been over the last three months, all I can say is, I'm I, I hope going forward, and and I'm going to read a quick statement. Because at the end of this, Alston and Bird come to a couple different conclusions. And I, I've heard a lot of people talk about safe sport and the safe sport kind of umbrella that is encapsulated, not only kind of U.S. soccer, but more of the domestic, whether it's NWSL, it's USL, it's Major League Soccer. And a lot of that, I always felt like safe sport when we were talking about that was protecting um, the, the female side of the game, trying to make sure that everybody was in an environment that was inclusive and protective. And we've seen kind of the fallout of kind of the, the, the research and the investigations on the women's side of the game where safe sport came in and whether it's the, the Yates report and the implementation of the 12 step program being extraordinarily helpful going forward and setting kind of these standards of, of what needs to be done and, and the protective balances that need to be there. So that when something is out of line, unnecessary, unsavory, just flat out wrong, that players are protected. First thing I thought about was, is this falling under the umbrella of safe sport? Um, because I didn't, I never thought about the, the men's side of the game, the men's national side of the game, men's national team side of the game being exposed to something like this. Mm -hmm. Um, so when it was reported, how it was reported, how it was investigated, um, how both parties were forced to participate 
in this situation and then ultimately the outcome. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't look great for the Reynas. It, it absolutely doesn't. Yeah. There, there, there are a hundred percent are consequences based on the actions for Greg Berhalter. Um, the transparency about the incident, um, what seems to be the immediate acknowledgement of responsibility for the situation at play back in 1992, um, and the movement forward for he, his family, his wife, his children, everybody. Um, and, and I guess the, the, I'm going to use the air quotes, the clearing of his name professionally, which now affords him the opportunity, not just to, to be a candidate, to be the head coach for the U S men's national team, but to move on for whatever job is available to him in the future. I want to read this statement hmm. because I thought this was maybe the most important outcome of all of this from Alston and Baird, uh, bird, excuse me. The quote, the need to revisit U S soccer's policies concerning appropriate parental conduct and communication with staff at the national team level. Hmm. We will be updating the policies as we continue to work to ensure environments for all participants in our games. This is something that, at least in the United States, right? There, there, there's, there's various moments throughout sporting, and I don't care if it's travel volleyball, I don't care if it's soccer, I don't care if it's baseball, I don't care if it's football, I don't care, you know, whatever, cheerleading, dance, there is heavy involvement from parents. We we know that there, there's the micromanaging of the children and trying to get the best possible situations for their children. What this does, because we've never seen it at such an incredibly high level, is I think now it creates kind of a set of standards for the way that parents need to act going forward and what the involvement looks like. Because this was... This was such an elite level of involvement because of the complexity of the relationships, because of the complexity of the manager, Greg Berhalter, the complexity of Claudio Reyna and his role at Austin FC and being involved. In, and Claudio had interviewed for the general manager role back in 2019 as well. Mm -hmm. So as I try to verbalize this and all the verbal diarrhea I just said, at the end of the day, I never wanted to talk about this. I don't like yeah. this. I don't, I hate seeing stuff like this play out in the public eye. Um, and, and I'm, I'm hopeful now that we can step forward in a positive manner that Gio Reyna can continue his career, that he can somehow figure out a way with U S soccer to hammer out whatever details need to be hammered out going forward to continue to participate in the U S men's national team role. Mm. And that us as U.S. soccer can figure out whatever the future looks like because you need new leadership behind the scenes because Ernie Stewart and Brian McBride have left. And sooner rather than later, you've got to figure out the direction you want to go with regards to a head coach, a manager of this group. Because in a time when you should be continuing to trend forward and trending upwards, um, you are now placing all of the what I would say the development of U.S. soccer's men's national team on the shoulders of the players because we're not sure who is going to be the next leader of this group. I mean, it's an incredible story, and you covered a lot of ground there. And I think it's really interesting that the bit you read out, it's like one of those things that we have it all the time in the U.K. where we have, in terms of government, we have an unwritten constitution, and most things are done by convention. And one of the conventions, I would imagine, a very, very top-level soccer international football is don't text the manager mum. Hmm. And that's one of those things that you think, yeah, it goes without saying, of course I wouldn't. Like I wouldn't have my mum text my employer or even if they were old friends, like it's my job, it's my career, you need to leave it. And that's an unwritten rule. Yeah. Whereas it seems like US soccer at the very top men's level might need to have that rule put in. Give the manager... I don't know, a work phone and don't let the players' mums and dads have it. It seems bizarre, but that seems like it might have cured at least some uh, of these issues. Really briefly, because I want to move on to loads of other things and we haven't got all day on this podcast. Um, Greg Bearholter, he can now apply for his old job back. Would you yeah. tell him to stuff it if you were Greg? Um, no, I, I wouldn't. And this is another this is another really fascinating conversation because I am of the belief that there were three types of U.S. men's national team fans when Greg Berhalter was named manager. One, that were like, no chance. Not the right guy. Never going to give him the opportunity. 
because of the dynamics of Jay Berhalter, his brother being involved in U.S. soccer. Those that were indifferent that his brother was at U.S. soccer at the time when he was hired and that were going to be willing to give him a chance. And the third that were, it's my manager. It's my manager for the U.S. men's national team. I'm going to back him. When you would have asked, and I don't care, you can insert name here. It, it could be Jose Mourinho or it could be Tata Martino. If you would have said when he took over that group, you got to win, you win Nations League and you beat Mexico. You win CONCACAF Gold Cup and you beat Mexico. You qualify for the World Cup with this young group of players when everyone was kind of really kicking the can down the line and saying, ah, it's really not this one. It's the next World Cup in 2026. That's when we'll be in our prime. Um, he did all three of those. Mm. Then you move forward to the goal, uh, to the World Cup. He got them out of the group in a time where not many people were saying that this group had the experience nor the capability of getting out of the group. Now, the, the Holland situation and does Pulisic score? Does that change the dynamic? Does Louis Van Hall and his adjustments, did Greg get caught not paying attention or couldn't adjust quick enough? Or was it just a, a difference in level of caliber of player? Uh, up, up for debate constantly up for debate and will be up for debate forever. But I think Greg did enough to continue in his role to be the head coach of the U S men's national team. I also believe that there were probably coaches that are better suited and more qualified um, than Greg Berhalter to be the head coach of the U S men's national team. And yet I haven't seen anyone outside of the conversation about Jesse Marsh who has been 100%. That's the guy. I haven't seen a name where someone goes, yes. And everyone's like, yes, this is our guy for USA. This is the guy that's going to take this group of players to the next level. Is that so, possible? Does that exist? I don't I don't know. I, I really don't. I, I think that's why this no is manager such... has ever been hired anywhere for anything with universal acclaim, right? Ever. No, no, you're, you're right. But like, do you do you do you go find like the Louis Van Hall type of manager? You that just want is, to do the voice. Come on, be honest with us. Enjoy some mince pies on the vine. Um, <laughs> or do you do like what Morocco does and maybe you find, or, or Scaloni, right? Scaloni at the time Ugh. taking over Argentina, like no one thought that Scaloni was the man. And then he grew into the man. So this is where, if you would have said to me, Ernie Stewart, Brian McBride, had this situation not unraveled, I'll call it an entanglement because the Oscars were just here in LA where well, oh. I was in LA yesterday, an entanglement. Um, had this not played itself out, would Greg Berhalter probably have been retired? I would have said yes. I would have said, yeah, of course he's going to get a new deal. Look what he's done. He's checked a lot of these boxes. And by the way, he's still growing as a young manager. He He's only in his mid forties, right? So, or, or maybe mid to late forties now. Yeah, I, I think this is the conundrum for U.S. soccer is, in the meantime, Anthony Hudson, an assistant coach, didn't do great in Major League Soccer with the Colorado Rapids, is now running effectively the U.S. men's national team. Two friendlies in January are one thing. In a week and a half's time, we start Nations League, which is still Nations League for CONCACAF. We are the reigning champions of Nations League. So you've got a game at Granada, a game at home against El Salvador in Orlando. And you've got a game that was just announced before we started uh, recording this program in April, which is uh, an international friendly against our most hated biggest rival against Mexico down in Glendale, Arizona. Um, and, and then you're going into the Gold Cup this summer. So decisions have to be made. And oh, by the way, U.S. soccer is focusing on the preparation for the Women's World Cup in New Zealand with the women's national team. So it felt like everything was stable and settled and we're going in the right direction. And then the nuclear bomb went off from the inside out. And now there's more questions than there are answers from this level, but this group, put my pen down, this group, th this player group right now, I don't think we could be in a better phase because now we are empowering this group of players to be the leaders. Not not the manager, not the honchos at U.S. soccer, this group of players to hold themselves accountable, to take a next step forward, and to build upon what I think was a very successful World Cup performance. And if you don't, Gio's mom will call you. Um, 49, by the way, uh, Greg Bohalter. So I'm delighted the way you said that was mid-40s, because I'm 37 now. And if anyone asks, I say I'm in my early mid-30s. <laughs> Which, of course, is uh, <laughs> early, true. late 30s. It's not yeah. true, but it, it sounds better.